Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another bi-monthly installment of Learning with Leverage. Uh, my name is Dave Hughes. I'm the Director of Product Management here at Leverage. Um, we are the service corporation for the League of Southeastern Credit Unions. And I am very pleased and honored to in introduce our distinguished presenter this morning, Ms. Cheryl Lawson. A little bit about Cheryl. Uh, she joined JMFA in 2001, rising quickly from consultant to engagement manager to executive vice president of implement implementation, easier for me to say. Today, she serves as executive vice president of compliance review for Overdraft Her Village ensuring the fulfillment of all regulatory requirements. Her responsibilities also include high-level sales support and administration for financial institutions. Cheryl is a sought-after authority for compliance issues related to overdraft programs. She continues to be involved, invited to speak at numerous industry events. Cheryl's impressive background includes more than 30 years of experience in global information technology and financial operations, as well as consulting, communications, training, and product management. Uh, the Houston native earned her bachelor's in English from Carnegie Mellon University, followed by an MBA from Rice University. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Cheryl. Thank you so much, Dave, and thanks to all of you for being a part of this. Um, I wanna say first that I apologize for the confusion it's never good to start late, so we're going to do all that we can to respect your time. Um, the goal that I have in this next few minutes is really just to kind of talk through some of the key areas around overdraft services, risks, retirements, and uh, requirements, and best practices. Uh, I, I will tell you that this does not have to be a lecture. If there are things that you want to know more about, you can put them in the chat. I think Dave can probably help make sure that we've got uh, an opportunity to you know, hear your concerns or questions. I've actually inserted some questions slides to just afford us the opportunity for you to have engagement. So I say that because my goal is to not make this boring, but instead to make it enlightening. We'll start with uh, restitution risks related to Reg E. Uh, as we know, this has been a big deal since the uh, amendments to Reg E in 2011. Uh, our clients have not had problems in this environment, but that doesn't mean it's not been an issue across our industry. As you may note, in 2010, the amendments to Regulation E required the presentation of the A9 model consent form to all consumers. Before you could assess any fees, of course, the consumer has to opt in for ATM and everyday debit card overdrafts. We all know the form uh, in various forms or formats, we've seen it, and we all know the potential risk of having any fees assessed on accounts that have not opted in. You may remember that there have been a number of lawsuits across the years claiming that the form itself is inadequate, uh, saying that you know an overdraft occurs when you don't have enough money in your account to cover a transaction is just not enough uh, communication. And so we know that that's one of the many ways that Regulation E has caused chaos across the industry in the last several years. These are the four events that are required for a compliant Regulation E and therefore for any fees to be assessed. If any of these events are omitted, the fees that are assessed on ATM and everyday debit card transactions are subject to be restituted. You have to give the money back. First, the consumer must be given the form. There are small changes uh, that you're allowed to make like your phone number and the amount of your fee but the form must be substantially similar to the, um, uh, for, uh, the, the federal form for it to be compliant. And then the consumer has to be given time to respond. They have to opt in and the financial institution must provide a written confirmation. Now the confirmation itself can be a copy of the form and sometimes institutions will do that, hand them the form back. But they can also send a confirmation letter that may come later, a day later, two days later from the core. So then we go to what I think is a question that I hear a lot. Do I have to keep a record of my consumer's opt-in decision? The answer is yes, you do have to keep a record of their decision, but you don't have to keep paper. Uh, the regulation specifically states that the consumer may provide their decision telephonically or electronically. And there would be in those cases, no paper copy. 
Of course, your procedures should clearly indicate that you consistently record the consumer's decision in the core. Some compliance officers I've met prefer to have a paper copy of the consumer's decision. They're allowed to do that, but they're not required to do so. So let's look at some best practices around Regulation E. These are things that our company has recommended include making the service available to as many consumers as appropriate. Consumers have to make the decision to allow the financial institution to assess the fees. And so when you educate them at account opening and remind them until they've made a decision, you're giving them the opportunity to take advantage of this important service. Of course, you will provide consumers the, the form at account opening. In some cases, the consumer will decide then to either opt in or opt out. When the decision has not yet been made, they don't make the decision at account opening, we recommend that you send the form again in reminder mailings until the consumer has made their decision. And if you find a consumer who has had overdrafts on their ATM or everyday debit transactions, but they've not yet opted in, they can be called and the regulation e-service can be discussed in light of their use of overdrafts on their ATM and everyday debit card transactions. And then finally, when you're making collections calls, you know, for the accounts that are overdrawn, make sure the consumers who use the service bring their accounts to a positive balance. A big part of our company's emphasis is on educating our clients. And so this particular topic, reducing Reg E restitution risk, was the subject of a compliance update not very long ago. And its purpose really was to give in insight to our clients. We believe that not only should you have a small intro overdraft limit for eligible accounts, you know, a small dollar amount that allows you to start affording them overdraft access immediately after opening the account. We also believe that if you have a consumer who's had an overdraft limit and they've dis you know, done something they shouldn't have done, um, gone overdrawn, stayed too long, uh, exceeded their limit, et cetera, that you don't take the entire limit away, but that you bring it back to a small limit. And the reason for that is because it allows you to not require a subsequent Reg E opt-in. If I turn the limit altogether off and I take the balance of the limit to zero, so there is no limit, then you're required by law to go back and ask the consumer again, for a Reg E decision. So I say that because it's an important context and I don't think we sometimes talk about what happens in the Reg E world if I've been given a limit, but then I misbehave and my limit is taken away. Uh, at JMSA, we know the importance of holding that Reg E decision for as long as is appropriate given the needs that consumers have for occasional overdrafts. So as I come to the end of the section on restitution around Reg E, let me ask, are there any questions on that topic that you want to put in the chat and we can certainly answer those as they go, or we can wait till the end and that's allowed also. I don't I'll see hold on a second and the, give uh, folks a chance. Yeah, I don't see anything in the Q&A yet. Can you see the Q&A, Cheryl? Okay. I don't know that I can. Okay. I'll let you know then. I'll let you I'm know. Gonna, thank up. you so much. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll go on to the next topic. When is intervention necessary? I want to talk about this because we know that not every consumer uses an effective overdraft program sensibly. So making a program really work for them and for you is going to take some effort. I like this visual because it helps us to remember that consumers are in charge of their own activity. Your financial institution likely provides nearly all of these services. Statistically, less than 20% of consumers have access to a line of credit. And sometimes they've exhausted the funds there anyway. A lot of consumers have secondary accounts in the credit union, they have to have a share account. And if there are funds there, fantastic. However, I know that many consumers don't keep enough money in their secondary account to fund their occasional overdrafts anyway. You may or may not have an alert system for low balances. I've seen this technology grow significantly, but even then, it's a consumer-driven function. 
The consumer has to sign up for the low balance alert and then they have to pay attention to them. And finally, the check register is maybe, frankly, a thing of the past for a lot of people. I still use my check register, but I don't know a lot of people that still do. So you see at the top of this slide, I've put in big letters, generalizations. So let me make some broad generalizations about consumer behavior. On the left, we see the occasional overdrafter. Maybe these people are like the CFPB reports of consumers whose accounts cure in three days or less. They often run out of money right ahead of payday. They're about to get paid and they don't have enough and a transaction or two comes through. These people may be well-funded. They may have plenty of money actually, but they just don't move their money into the deposit account in time to avoid the overdraft. These are the people who might be surprised by a fee since they don't reconcile their statement or maintain a clear image of how much money they have. I think that this generalized description sort of mirrors some of the account holders that I've come in contact with. And then on the right, there's the frequent overdrafter. Sometimes, frankly, I think that this is the population that kind of lives in the red. They tend to go negative every month. Uh, sometimes it's our seniors or persons on disability who are included in this group. They have too little to live on. And so they use the overdraft privilege limit to get them to the next check. And again, it's a broad generalization, but I think that we can agree there are people like this who are a part of our financial institutions. These both sides of the, of, the, of, the, of the slide are not necessarily high risk accounts because although they may overdraft a small amount of, a month or a large amount of month, they are always curing their own accounts but they can be of significant interest when examiners come in. So here's a question that kind of lends itself to this specific issue. Can I turn off overdraft privilege on a consumer who uses it too much? I guess I could put air quotes around the too much because that's something that every institution has to decide for themselves. The answer to the question is of course, yes, you can. You can turn it off, but remember, that this program is discretionary. Look at the whole account, look at the behavior. Remember that families sometimes have issues that can impact their need of a service like this. Maybe a spouse lost a job, or maybe there's a family member who's sick, or maybe there's been a death in the family. And so if the behavior is occasional, that's a lot different than where you see constant behavior of overdrawing the account that puts the institution at risk. Then, it may be prudent to terminate the privilege on those accounts. But remember, and this is something that I always try to remind us about, if we're not giving them support, if they can't depend on your institution, will that consumer end up at a payday lender instead? So let's talk about what happens to this population of heavy users. And again, heavy is a term that I'm not gonna say there's a formal specific, it has to be this or that, uh, the FDIC said if it's more than six overdrafts in a rolling 12 months, that's excessive use. So maybe we want to say it's that number, but I know most institutions can put, um, you know, we'll see transactions um, of six items in 12 months in a day or a week. Certainly it takes much less than a year. So here are some of the strategies that we see that work for clients and for institutions to consider as they consider what has been the strategy from the agencies. Regularly review the account activity. Look at your overdrawers. Determine whether there are behaviors that you need to be responsive to. Mail a letter. We believe firmly that if you mirror what the FDIC supervisory guidance identified as send communication or half communication after six overdraft fees in a rolling 12 month period, then you are you know, meeting the requirements to the letter of the law. And then we think that continuing to have periodic communication is important. So why not add a statement uh, message for those consumers that have had more than six overdrafts in a rolling 12 month period? Every month that statement goes out, every month that note on the statement is going to be visible. A lot of institutions have realized that, you know, one letter at six overdrafts is sort of a drop in the bucket for some of their consumers. They may have 50 or 100 overdrafts in a year. 
And so why not define internally another frequency? Maybe you decide that at 25 overdraft fees, or maybe you decide at 35 overdraft fees. It doesn't matter, but it demonstrates a commitment to educate the consumer and encourage their changing their behavior. And then, of course, you're going to have phone conversations for a number of different reasons. Talk about their overdraft usage as a part of those conversations when you're on the phone with consumers. This is the exact strategy that allows institutions to say, I understand what the agencies have indicated is a concern. Here are all the things that I do to encourage my consumer to not be a heavy user and to be aware of their heavy use. And we try to minimize or ultimately to even re re resolve or revise their usage. This kind of restates a lot of that. We feel strongly that you know, sending additional heavy user counseling communications is a part of that. What you send and how often you send it is a decision made institutionally. I might think 25 is enough. Somebody else might say, oh no, I think that's too small a number for us. Maybe we wanna to go to 50. It's whatever number you determine, but it's important that there become a communication method. It's kind of a procedure that you build internal to the institution that allows you to make sure that the users are being educated and re-educated on the basis of the minimums established by the FDIC and the what I'll call the strategies internal to the financial institution. So that section was really just about heavy use. And I wanna go on, but I wanna make sure if there's anybody who's got a question or a concern that we address that also. Okay, we do have a question here, Cheryl. Here it is. Okay. We had a question come up today. An elderly member is experiencing confusion when it comes to overdraft privilege and where her money is going. Is this enough of a reason to turn off the privilege on that account? Wow, great question. Um, I would suggest that you'd want to have uh, uh, someone in the branch or someone in operations spend some time with that senior. I might also ask whether the senior uh, has a family member that's on their account who might be included in that conversation. The, 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 po the possibility of turning off the service makes sense. But before you do that, I think you don't want to create more confusion by simply disabling a service. I think it would be helpful to have the family's involvement if there is anyone on that account, uh, you know, um, um, a POD or anything like that, um, so that you make sure that you're able to support the senior before just disabling the service. I, 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 I remind myself all the time, we're in the people business. Um, the reason we have jobs is because they gave us their money and that allows us to keep the doors open. So what resources we can provide them, I think we have to be sensitive to what can they handle and, and, and how I would handle that was I would try to find somebody in the family if there is anybody who might be able to be a part of that conversation. Great question, never had that question before. All right, I'll go on to regulator expectations for fee amounts. This is something that's kind of popped up in the last year and a half or so. You know, people have asked me, is my fee too high? You know, have I got to change my fee because, you know, Bank of America or Capital One changed their fee? You know, is there something wrong with my fee? So I want to look at the data on this one. The CFPB published a data point in 2021 that shows the fees for financial institutions by asset size and for banks and credit unions. I will say that credit union fees are slightly smaller than bank fees, but that's not news to any of us. This was an analysis of about 900 financial institutions. So it's big, but it's not all inclusive. According to this data, credit union fees are around 2750 for an overdraft or NSF, and bank fees are about $2 higher. So if your fee is much higher than either of these, you might wanna discuss whether a fee change is appropriate. But we don't recommend that you lower your fee. We're not in a, you know, everybody, you know, you know kind of have a uh, Chinese fire drill about fees. In a few minutes, we'll talk about what we think examiners are actually looking for as we've seen our clients be examined across the years. And fee amounts may be one of the items that they're looking at. But I also wanna say that in another CFPB report that talked specifically about overdraft and NSF fee reliance. 
the agency reported that the overdraft market and fee reliance are stable and very persistent. So I don't think that that's a clarion call for a change in our fees. I think it tells us that if nothing's broke, don't fix it. The next topic is kind of a top of mind one. And we see a ton of activity in the world of authorized positive settle negative. I use the APSN abbreviation for that. First, in 2016, so now seven years ago almost, uh, six and a half years ago, um, uh, the Federal Reserve presented in the regulatory uh, webinar this slide, available balance at posting. When the item is authorized on a positive balance, it says, and intervening transactions deplete the balance, if a fee is assessed on the account when it settles, it violates the FTC Act for unfair or deceptive acts or practices. The reason I'm emphasizing that is it, we've known this for a long time. It's been hot news lately, but it isn't just coming to the table. We've been aware of it for a while. Here's the slide that they used in the 2016 webinar to address the issue of authorized positive settle negative. Notice that there are two balances, available and ledger. On day one, there's $100 in the account in both the available and the ledger balance. And then a signature-based debit transaction of $80 is authorized, which reduces the available balance to $20 while the ledger balance remains 100. On day two, a $40 check posts, which takes the available balance to a negative $20. The ledger balance though is $60 because the signature-based debit has not hit. And then as you can see, a fee is assessed. And then on day three, the signature-based transaction posts into the account. The available balance was negative and a fee is assessed. Unfortunately, the original $80 transaction should not have been assessed any fee because it was authorized on a positive balance on day one. This is a compliance update that we issued right after the publication last October, September of the uh, CFPB circular 2206. It is um, an important institute, it's important because what we did was we looked across the FTC Act at the issues associated with authorized positive settle negative. I think I may be losing you guys. Dave, can you see me? I can see you. Okay, good. All right. The thing came up with something on my screen. I stress out about this today. This is not my day. Okay, uh, what I want to say. Oh, I'm sorry. We just lost your um, your screen. Your my slides. Hold yeah, on. your slides. I thought it was going out. Hold on. Okay. Let's see if I can figure out how to get it back up. Hmm. I will tell you that I'm glad that I'm on the phone because if I were on this session, you would have lost my voice. Now I got to just figure out how to share screen again. And see. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you all, I appreciate your patience. It's not my day for technology, I guess. So anyway, the point of that was that we looked at every area in the FTC Act. Uh, the elements or the prongs under the um, uh, unfairness prong and the deceptive prong. And our focus was on looking at how to solve how to respond to the CFPB circular at the same time that we continue to support effectively disclosed overdraft programs. In 2017, after the 2016 webinar, our company revised our disclosures. We knew that there needed to be more language around authorized positive settle negative. Let me say that in 2016, when they raised that issue, there was no technology in any core system across the country that could avoid assessing the fee on that $80 debit transaction in error. There was nothing that could fix that problem. The agencies did not anticipate it when they wrote regulation ease amendments and it became a problem in the mid-20 mid teens. They recognized it, but there was no solution. 
Then in September of 2018, we recognized the importance of giving back any fees on APSN technology, APSN transactions, when you're notified of them. Not researching everyone, not never assessing any fees, but recognizing that if a fee is assessed in error and a consumer says, hey, you charged me for this transaction and it was authorized when I had money in the account, recognizing that that consumer is right and has a right to that fee back. And then as you can see in 2019, we began to see the technology solution. It wasn't in place in 2017, but over the years that followed, some courts have resolved that issue. And certainly we recognize the importance of clarity and disclosures across the years but also em employing the technology when it became available, which is ultimately the solution to the APSN problem. There's no way to guarantee that a transaction that's authorized on positive and settles into a negative balance account isn't assessed a fee unless your technology provider fixes it. It is a core solution. So we've recommended implementing the module wherever you can. It has a lot of different names, Sometimes they call it good fund, sometimes it's a patch, but whatever solution is available under the core, we recognize that that fixes this problem. Now, there's a section we'll talk about in a few minutes around litigation, and there've been a lot of cases of lawsuits on APS in as well. So it's a huge issue, not just from an agency perspective when you are examined, but also from a litigation perspective, because you never know when some consumer is gonna go and you know, create a suit against you. So our company, because of our work with financial institutions, has looked at which cores have fixed the authorized positive settle negative issue. If your core is on this list, if you see your core, you should already be able to resolve the problem. You should have installed it or you should get in touch with them and find out how quickly you can. If you have a core that has fixed it and they're not on my list, because for some reason maybe I don't have any clients that use your core, share your core's name with me because I'd love to update my list and make it more correct. So this is the question that I get a lot. My core doesn't have a fix, or if they do, I don't know that they have one. How do I get them to fix it? So we've asked our clients where that occurs to do a series of things in a kind of very formal way. Paper trail is important because one of your audiences is your examiner. So we encourage you to send a formal request for the solution, describe the problem, authorize positive, settle negative, transaction comes in, the account is positive, later when the item settles, the account is negative, the fee is assessed in error, you want that fixed. And then follow that up with regular emails or requests. If there's a users group for your core, join it and ask the, the, for the fix there. Document what you're doing, keep a trail, a paper trail, because that is part of your compliance due diligence. When an examiner comes and says, what's going on with you and authorized positive, settle negative, you want to be able to say, I've been pressing my core for the last four or six months to get this solved, or I've gotten it scheduled, we haven't installed it, we're working on implementation, or we're considering changing cores, we can't get it fixed. But you want to have a record of that, because the APSN issue is one that's not going away. It does represent a litigation risk as well as an examination risk and only the cores can fix it. So I have another slide for questions. If there are any questions at this point? I don't see any. Okay, everybody knows about APSN, great. So we'll talk about representments. This is another top of mind concern. Um, we're gonna be talking about things that, you know, this has changed over the last several months or years. And I think it's important for us to look at this as well. In August of last year, our company put out a compliance update that looked at the supervisory guidance. It talked about the specifics of what risk mitigating activities institutions can adopt or are already using that directly respond to these UDAP concerns. Uh, if, you, if you think about it, multiple fees must not be assessed for the same transactions without a practice to provide the consumer a notice to let them cure the account. The concept of representment is I've sent an item back to NSF and it's coming back to me again. By giving the consumer the ability to cure the account prior to the representment, 
your institution is doing all that you can to protect the or to protect the consumer from a second fee. The heart of the guidance on representment is if the consumer is unaware that an item can represent and a second fee is assessed, then the institution may have caused consumer harm. The reason that we use NSF notices or next day notices is to educate the consumer and to tell them, hey, this item's gonna come back through. You need to bring the account positive. Let's go forward, sorry. Uh, this is a really great question. I get it from credit unions a lot. And I understand, I understand. When financial institutions looked at the costs of mailing over the last several years, you know, postage right now, 63 cents for a stamp, which is crazy. They thought that they could save a few dollars by discontinuing NSF notices. But now with this issue of representment, it emphasizes the importance of that NSF notice. So we think you should restart sending notices. Now, if you're paying a lot of items, the number of NSF notices that you're sending is a smaller number than it was when you were returning all your items. So the dollars go up per item, but the quantity of items should have gone down. If a consumer is given an NSF notice, they have the ability to cure the account prior to the item representing. Even though we know it's expensive to mail, it's important to do something. So if you have email communication and your members have allowed you to, to, to send them communications by email, send the notice by email. But, but in some way you need to get the word out to that consumer. Now I have a, a, a firm belief that every year you should be sending out some sort of disclosure. Uh, in our client base, we may send twice a year or even four times a year. When changes occur, you wanna make sure that your disclosure language has been put in front of your consumers afresh. The um, uh, um, representment issue was one that a client of ours a few months ago experienced. And I think it's helpful to just kind of tell the story. Uh, the client got an exam in the myriad, in the middle of the period between when the um, FDIC issued the article on, on, on representment and when it became guidance. So in March, it came out as an article. In August, it came out as guidance. So during that summer period, this client got an exam. The examiner walked in and said, I want five years of representment data on all your consumers. The client contacted us and said, I don't know anything about representment. We don't have any representment reports. And we talked through the issues of the FTC Act and the FDIC's article, which later became guidance. That institution, that client had been sending out uh, disclosures. I call them education materials that specifically talked to representment and at the time that the item presents the first time, that client was sending an NSF notice and the NSF notice that the client was sending said, hey, bring your account positive, this thing's gonna come back. And the, uh, the definitions that were questioned by the FDC's, FDIC supervisory guidance of what is an item versus what is a transaction were clearly disclosed in the communications sent to the consumer. So we've done everything we could to mitigate the risk and the, educating, uh, uh, the, the client educated the examiner and the examiner took all that stuff away and left the exam to find out what his final result would be. He came back finally later and he said, everything you're doing addressed all of our concerns around representment for every consumer in your overdraft privilege program. So the only thing I want you to do now is to get information for me on the representment data for your non-overdraft privilege consumers. In that institution, it was less than 200 accounts. So it, it helps to paint the picture that when you're doing these things, you've fixed, resolved, addressed the biggest concern in the area of representment, and that is that the consumer doesn't know enough to cure and that you've not educated the consumer around the terminology associated with representment items. So here's a question. We're preparing for an exam. Should we do a look back, even if our disclosures were clear about charging for an item each time it is represented? Um, I will say that this is specifically a question around unfairness and whether the financial institution should do the look back. I have to say every examiner is probably going to ask you about a look back. Whether you properly disclosed or not, they probably still want to know whether there's any money on the table for restitution. 
So when the analysis is done, tell your examiner that your disclosures for most or even all of your consumers have addressed representment. And that's only if they have. And if you have any refunds associated with represented items, you should tell them that as well. Since I know that sometimes clients have asked for refunds, you should incorporate that result as part of your analysis. Um, I do have a client I talked to probably two weeks ago, and the CEO said, it's really hard for us to get this representment data. It's, it's all manual. The reports that we have from our core are crappy. They don't give us everything lined out easily for us to figure it out. She said, what do you think we should do? I said, well, you've disclosed properly. You've educated consumers about representment. You're using NSF notices. You've done everything to mitigate risk. It's a lot of work to do it manually, and you may not be required given all the things you've already done. So the decision is yours. The CEO said, my decision is we're not doing the work. It's too hard. It's too much. And if the examiner demands it, then we'll go through it at that time. I said, that's fine. She is having her exam now. The CEO of that institution is having her exam now. And as of today, they've not asked for any representment analysis data. So I don't want to make it so that everybody feels like they spent, have to spend a you know, month preparing. But you should be prepared that they're going to ask because representment is top of mind for the agencies right now. And it's an important element of their overdraft program review. And we know that. And worst case, they ask for it and you say, yeah, but I disclosed it and we gave a lot of refunds and here's the data. And they say, fine, you're covered. What about this one consumer or this two consumers or some small fraction? We believe that with clear disclosures and notices, you have been able to not only address the issue, but also continue charging the NSF fees. The, the absence of representment issues, I think, is addressed by transparency. It's a huge part of what we do. All right. I think we've come close to the end of the time. I don't want to go too much over, so I'm just going to kind of move through this next section fairly quickly. I want to respect your time. I know you have a lot of stuff on your plate. So let's look at the 600-pound gorilla in our industry right now, which is litigation. Uh, there are a lot of demand letters and lawsuits that are being filed. Uh, some companies have actually kind of created a service line that just attacks financial institutions overdraft programs. We know that consumers can click on a web page and the next thing you know, the credit union is going to have a lawsuit. Not that you've done anything wrong, just that the firm has a plaintiff and maybe a couple of months of statements and they file a claim. Um, what I will say is that this is a common description in the lawsuit, unlawful overdraft fees. I don't know how to get rid of that thing in the front of the screen. Um, this could come as a demand letter. It could come as a lawsuit. Uh, it says something very broad, like it appears my client has been charged with overdraft fees, even when sufficient funds exist. The big issue here has to do with available balance, making sure the consumers understand how much money they have in the account. These lawyers are so lazy, they use the same lawsuit over and over and over again and just change the name of the financial institution and the name of the plaintiff. And it's easy because there are a lot of institutions that don't trust their own programs. And so they sort of hurry up and say, well, maybe we should settle. They go to their lawyers, they go to um, you know, their, their, their local counsel and the local counsel says, well, we'll settle for a smaller amount that will cost less than going to court. I don't agree that that's the position it should be taken, but I see it happen a lot. Then there's the authorized positive settle negative from the regular, from the litigation perspective. I see these cases, the same thing. Uh, they come in here essentially to, to say you didn't disclose, you haven't addressed this, your system doesn't um, you know, fix this. I had a case literally that I'm talking to the CEO and their staff tomorrow. I've worked on it all of last week trying to assist this financial institution client of ours. The claim was um, authorized positive, settle negative. You cannot have an authorized positive, settle negative transaction if you don't have regulation E turned on. This consumer that they used as their plaintiff does not have regulation E turned on. So there is absolutely no chance in, I won't say the word, but H-E double hockey sticks <laughs> that there's ever going to be an APSN basis for that plaintiff but the lawyers don't even notice stuff like that. They don't even pay attention. And so they file the suit anyway. So I, I use it as an example of 
you may win without even realizing you're going to win because they don't even know what they're doing. I don't have a lot of respect for those lawyers. And then, of course, the issue of representment. This one is harder in litigation than APSN because it's not about technology. It's not about do I have the patch? It's about do I have transparency? Have I covered everything? Have I given back fees assessed in error? Have I made the basis of this claim irrelevant or moot? Um, I know that you can do everything right and still get a litigation. I know that. And so the only way to be prepared is to have a strong defense. You can't always, you know, you can do everything perfectly and still get a suit. So it doesn't mean anything. The best, descent, the best defense is always going to be to have a fully compliant solution that focuses on consumers. I think if I can make all of my consumers happy, they may not click on those web pages and they won't try to get a suit against us. Ultimately, what you want to do is to find a way to make consumers as happy as you can. So I want to end with some tips for your exams. I know everyone has exams across the, the year. Uh, this is the biggest question that we're hearing right now. What have you changed? Tell us what have you changed in your program? And there are a number of ways that you can look at that. One is technology. You know, do you have uh, APSN turned on? Have you talked about the possibility of adjusting the cost to consumers, de minimis or caps on fees? For banks, a lot of times if they have a recurring fee, they can turn that off. That represents a small change for them, but it does represent a fee change that impacts their revenue, but it also allows them to say, we're looking at ways to reduce consumer costs. And of course, making sure that there's refunds of anything that was assessed in an APSN environment in error. And then the issues associated with the representment. This is a lot around transparency and disclosures. The NSF notices a disclosure, obviously making sure that you define representment in your disclosure that it could occur. And when an item comes back, we will assess a fee. And then I've also talked a good deal about heavy user counseling. And I think that that's important because even though representment is not just around heavy users, it is an important element on one of the changes that you make to make your program more sensitive to the market. And you know, I've covered a lot of stuff in a little bit of time. And of course we had to hang up and come back on and couldn't hear each other and all this stuff. So as a special gift to everyone here, we are happy to share an ebook that's called Does Your Overdraft Program Check All the Boxes? It hits on a lot of the things that I've talked about, but it does so in a colorful and I think an effective way. And I know we're at the end of the hour or the end of the block of time that we have, but if there are any other questions, I'm happy to take them. Okay, we have a question here, Cheryl. Our guide to member services state that we may charge for re resentment and gives a detailed explanation of what that means. Does that suffice to say we have notified members they could have this NSF fee? So I guess I have to ask a question back and I don't know that I can have a conversation with the person. Uh, if the disclosure was given at the time, for example, of new account opening, but it's not given frequently, doesn't, doesn't happen but one time, um, I would say you might consider you know, publishing something or, or, or reissuing something. Um, it doesn't answer the most important question about representment for me, and that is the NSF notice question. Are you sending an NSF notice? And if the answer is yes, then I would say consider adding language in the NSF notice that says, hey, this item's going to come back. You know, come in and make a deposit. Not just your account is negative $60 and this item was returned NSF, but, you know, this item is returned in SF and it can come back. So my answer is I look at a holistic response in the area of representment because there is no technology solution for it exactly. And part of that is educating the consumer that we do do representment, that items will be assessed a fee and that we send an NSF notice and that the NSF notice is transparent and communicates that the consumer should bring the account positive. Okay, that's all the questions we have. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dave. And thanks to all of you for your patience with my technology. I'm going to, as soon as this is over, throw the computer against the wall and act like I've never known anything about technology. And I'm very excited to have had a chance to talk to everyone at Leverage. Great. Thank you very much, Cheryl, for your time and wisdom.
Um, everybody, I put um, my email address in the webinar chat if you have any questions about this webinar specifically. Uh, if you have any uh, questions about JMFA's overdraft privilege product, you can email us at consult at myleverage.com. And uh, just so you know, um, we have another webinar coming up on May 23rd. Uh, community Outreach with CUNA Professional of the Year, Shay Brown of Leaders Credit Union. Um, hopefully you'll join us and you will be getting an email invite. Probably, uh, well, you should have received one about a week ago and you'll get another one in a week. So thank you for hanging in there with us and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.